Welcome to Myanmar Musings, a podcast of the Myanmar Research Centre at the Australian National University, Canberra. I'm Luke Corbin. It's October 17, 2022, and today we are speaking with Rosalie Metro, Assistant Teaching Professor in the College of Education at the University of Missouri, Columbia. Rosalie has published widely on education and particularly the curriculum in Myanmar, as long as, uh, sorry, as well as authoring textbooks and a novel, Have Fun in Burma. Hello, Rosalie. Hi. Thanks for coming on the show. Now, you have a recent edited book chapter in the book, Teaching for Peace and Social Justice in Myanmar, Identity, Agency and Critical Pedagogy, edited by Mary Shepherd Wong, in which you reflect with your, with your co-author, Aung Kain, on developing the Histories of Burma textbook that the two of you wrote. I thought we could maybe start a bit back to front and ask about this textbook that you co-authored, um, which is intended for secondary and post-secondary Burmese students or students of Myanmar history um, and was published in 2013 with uh, Mo'u uh, Education. So um, what is this textbook and how does it differ? What does it do differently to what has traditionally, the history traditionally taught in, in Myanmar in, in recent years? So instead of saying what happened, that students are supposed to memorize, um, Histories of Burma presents them with a collection of primary source documents. So there are about 100 documents that are part of the textbook, and it organizes those documents into thematic units, and they then analyze the documents. So they come to their own conclusions about what the documents show about the history of Burma. So if they read a speech about Aung San, the point is not to admire him or think he's a bad person, but rather to understand what he was saying and how that connects to the present and how it's influenced the situation in Myanmar today. So a lot of times the government textbooks in Myanmar formerly had a preface in their history textbooks, and it would say the purpose of studying history is to develop myoche seite, or um, patriotism, and pidaun su seite, unity spirit, union spirit. And in contrast, the purpose of histories of Burma is to give students the tools that they need to form their own conclusions about history. Okay, right. And um, I've uh, flicked through and have been delighted by the, the sources that you chose, actually. There's a lot of um, direct sources in there that I've only read about, you know, not not read the originals. And um, I wondered, uh, how did uh, the two of you choose those particular sources and how did you maybe uh, find them and settle on, on, on because that's incredibly important, isn't it, um, the events that you choose to discuss about when you teach and learn history? Yeah. Um, so I should also say that our purpose in writing this textbook, besides having students take more of the initiative in their learning, was also to promote reconciliation among ethnic groups, religious groups, different social classes that have been divided in the past for various reasons. So we tried to select documents that went beyond the perspective of the majority Bama Buddhists and that included perspectives of other groups, you know, who have often been left out of history. So women, ethnic minorities, religious minorities, and our goal was to present that larger set of sources because one thing we found when we talked to teachers was that they had ideas about history that came from the way they had been educated, but they had never had access to the primary source documents. So when we would talk to a Bama Buddhist teacher, they would say the Penlong Agreement unified all the people in Burma and everybody was happy to sign it. And a Karen teacher would say, no, we were not part of that conference and we never agreed. But neither of them had had the opportunity necessarily to read the agreement. And so the discussions or arguments that they were having about history, they didn't have the common ground or um, kind of set of knowledge on which to base those discussions just because those documents had been really hard to get. So we, um, I was lucky that my co-author, um, Saya Ankain, is a real 
expert in history. And so he had a lot of connections with people who had private libraries and he knew about sources online. And so we just tried to gather kind of broad and deep in terms of what people might want to know about the history of Burma. But I also want to say that there's a lot that's still left out you know, so neither of us read ethnic languages. And so we couldn't put in documents that were written in ethnic languages and translate them. And so it's by no means complete, but it's kind of a start or a gesture toward what a more inclusive history of Myanmar would look like. And I can only imagine what um, some of the discussions w- would be like when um, people are learning about these. Um, some of the sources present, you know, are, are a mark contrast. Like there's the reaction written in the chronicles by the Myanmar monarchy on the the, the treaty of Yanabo after at the first war, and then there's the the sort of a British version of that, and they're just so remarkably removed. Um, do you have any uh, memories of of being involved in teaching uh, what, any of these sources and and seeing, you know, in person how how people actually um, not only learn about history but maybe take steps towards the kind of reconciliation goals that that you're aiming for? Yes. One thing that I described in the chapter that you mentioned was um, a workshop that Saya Aungkain and I did in Mesa in 2009 or 2010. And we kind of had teachers reenact some of the events around um, Burmese independence so we had one group represents the AFPFL delegation and another, um, the Karen delegation, and then the British. And it was interesting because I think a lot of the, and it was a, it was a mix of ethnic people. So mostly Bama and Karen, but also some other ethnicities. And a lot of the Karen people had kind of grown up seeing the British as a positive force in the development of their community, their protectors. And so reading the telegrams where the British said things like, let's just leave, we're going to have to abandon our commitment to the Karen. We're just going to, the phrase is, leave Burma to hold the baby of this (laughs) unfortunate union or whatever, you know. And I think seeing that actually the British didn't have their best interests at heart and were preoccupied with their own problems, right? They're running a war on like 500 different fronts. They just want to get out of the situation with as much convenience as possible. And so I think that was disheartening um, to some of the participants in the workshop. So I guess that would be an example of where a historical document kind of does this work of undoing a little bit of myth-making around history. Right. And I also recall uh, in there, there's also mention of um, people adamantly um, saying that the Karen were included in the Penglong Agreement. You know, they were there. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, these kinds of um, direct sources can can sort of put an end um, to that sort of um, myth-making. Um I wonder if this book, this this textbook that uh, was put together by you and Onkine, uh, is now nearly ten years old. So I wonder about the the sort of social life and the, and the afterlife of this book um, since then. So what has happened to it, uh, with it, around it since uh, it came um, into light? Uh, yeah, nine years ago. Is it being used now, and by whom, and all of that? Yes. So Mo'u does a great job of distributing the work that they publish. And they, so prior to the coup, um, they were working with a lot of different post-secondary schools, both inside and outside Myanmar, to get this book um, into use. And I don't have the exact numbers on like how many students used it, but it's also, we always intended it as a resource for self-study. So I recently was in touch with a young person inside Myanmar who's involved with student unions and who also is involved with labor unions. And that person said to me, your book has been a really good resource for participants in the labor union to learn more about the history of labor relations in Myanmar, which that's the theme of one of our 
units. And that was really gratifying to us, um, especially since we've had the Burmese translation done um, five five years ago or so, maybe more than that, um, that people have been able to just go out and study the book on their own or form study groups that it doesn't have to necessarily be part of a formal educational setting. And I hope that that will continue, especially since a lot of opportunities to formally study inside Myanmar um, have kind of closed down. Yeah, that's that's right. Have you thought about doing a second volume or a sequel or updating it or changing its format or anything like that? Um, maybe just as time has gone on and you've received feedback or um, directly uh, responding to the coup and the changes in access? It would probably be a good idea. Right now I'm in the process of doing a revised edition of a U.S. history textbook that I wrote that's on the same format as History of Burma. And that one was only published in 2017, so like five years ago. And the publisher thought so much has happened in the world since then with COVID and all this um political problems in the U.S., attempted coup, et cetera, um, that they wanted me to do a new version. And I think that if there was an opportunity, I think we would definitely be interested to revise it. There's so much more to include. But I think we also hope that now that people see the method, they can add to it themselves, you know, that teachers could find a recent document and incorporate it into one of the units of study I think our hope is that it could become more of like a um, open source kind of resource. I think that that's really the future of it, not to have us determining what documents should be included or which shouldn't because our biases and limitations are inevitably going to come into that. Um, but if I had the technological skills and if there's anyone out there who's inspired to do this, I think an online archive of documents um, would be really amazing to have. Yeah, that would be sensational. You know, there's a lot of um, – some of the sources that are in this textbook are also on, for example, archive.org, the Internet Archive, and open access uh, repositories on the Internet. But those repositories tend to um, be, you know, most easily accessible by people with already reasonable amount of education who can sort of get around these um, strange sort of archive-style websites. And then it's – it's not the same as having um, something uh, thematic regarding, for example, histories of, of Burma. That would be uh, terrific. Um, and the, the book that you referred to before that you're currently updating, uh, I think that that's Teaching World History Thematically. Is that the one? So there are two. There's a world history and there's a U.S. history. Yeah, but I got the idea by doing histories of Burma. And then when I taught history in high schools in the U.S., I used that same format, the primary sources and the thematic units, and I really loved teaching that way. So I've, yeah, applied it to several different subject areas. I was exactly going to directly ask you that about whether your experience, and not just with histories of Burma, but maybe uh, uh, researching and engaging with Myanmar's education system and curriculum, or perhaps with um, people uh, outside Myanmar in Mesot, where I know you spend a lot of time teaching. How did that lead you to to writing not just histories of Burma, but this this next book as well? Yeah, so there, I think worldwide there are similar issues in terms of majority minority politics or um, the supremacy of certain groups. So Bama Buddhist supremacy in Myanmar, which has been compared by several scholars to white privilege in the U.S. And um, there's Matt Walton's piece on that. And then responses to it now from Elliot Pressey Freeman and Stephen Campbell. Um, so kind of taking the discourse further. But I definitely found similar issues of, so I worked in a lot of different contexts in the U.S., but one of the contexts I worked in was um, in the Bronx in New York City, almost all of my students were black or Latino or from the Caribbean islands, or they were not white. Um, and when I, my textbook said like Columbus discovered America, you know, and some stupid stuff. And when I showed them Columbus's journal where Columbus says, 
these people would make great servants. Like, you know, we can easily capture them and take their gold. Seeing that made them so angry. Um, They had been lied to by their textbooks. And there are just similar issues that come up when young people are exposed to documents that kind of counter what they've been told. You know, and in the same way, when my white students in more privileged contexts read documents like John C. Calhoun's Slavery is a Positive Good, where he tries to argue that slavery is actually good for Black people. <laughs> and they're like, this is messed up, you know? And I think there's a similar kind of feeling of having your eyes opened for Bama Buddhists who read sources that reveal the brutality that runs through the conquest of ethnic people in Myanmar by Bama kings, you know, up to the military in the present day. And so I really found that, you know, although the contexts are, of course, very different, the emotional dynamics are similar and that the primary sources really help to build bridges between students who have had very different life experiences. I think that makes um, a lot of sense. Uh, And something that I'm thinking here again of these different contexts um, in which uh, you've taught history um, and the experience informing your writing of these textbooks is that uh, learning, whether it's history or mathematics, is not necessarily fun for anybody. And something that uh, you and Aung Khan stress a uh, method for engaging with history is role play, which seems quite important to, to using this textbook perhaps to, uh, or these textbooks perhaps to their high, full potential. So how important is role play to, to pedagogy or your pedagogy in general? How can incorporating role play benefit um, teaching the history of Myanmar and, and other things? So I talked a little about the role plays that we did in the workshop in Mesa, where we kind of went back to the moment of Myanmar's independence and tried to share documents that represented these several different perspectives. And we did that kind of instinctively, um, but reading later in different literature, I realized that what we had done was um, we were the first people to do this. So there's a tradition um, of applied theater and um Augusto Boal, who's a Brazilian educator and theater person, came up with this theater of the oppressed technique where he had people role play events from history and sort of return to moments of oppression in order to transform them, in order to give them different outcomes. And I found that idea really powerful. Um, So it's connected to Paulo Freire, another Brazilian educator who famously wrote this book, um, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, the idea there being that ordinary people um, and workers and farmers have intelligence and have the tools to understand their lives. They just need to be empowered to use them. And so I think the role plays allow people to go back in time and okay so in the present there are these conflicts from the past that are being re rehashed all the time but we're not always conscious that it's a conflict from the past we think it's just something that came up in the present and so to historicize that and to actually go back to those past moments and think and talk about what happened one it opens up new perspectives to people who may have been stuck in their own life experience and their own limited perspective. It helps people see and understand the biases that they have had and that they've been carrying around. And it also provides the possibility to create connections by opening people up to to these new perspectives. And so I think, you know, taking on the role of another person in history it's risky. It's not easy. Um, as a teacher, you never know what's going to happen. There can be, you know, a conflict, but I feel like teachers who have the skill to facilitate that kind of activity in a formal or informal educational setting, they can really transform people's perspectives. So 
there's this Burmese poem that we quote in the chapter about if there's a thorn in your palm, like don't just cover it up. (laughs) You have to take the thorn out. Like you have to do the hard work or it's never going to heal. And the temptation in the way we teach history is just to cover up those wounds, whether it's in the U S and kind of downplaying the brutality of racism and genocide and slavery or in Myanmar, kind of wanting people to forget violence that's been done to their ancestors. And I think I really believe that that doesn't solve the problem, like sweeping it under the rug is not going to work. We have to sort of investigate that wound and clean it out and show some sunlight on it for it to heal. And I I think a lot of people uh, feel the same way in general um and the the past 10 years 10 years leading up to 2021 uh, offered you know quite a few new opportunities for educate the education system in Myanmar um i wonder how do you think how can students and educators in the country and outside the country build build on the the momentum um given the devastation of the military coup in in 21 um yeah where, where how can we take what what was good about um, the, the the years leading up to the coup for education, and 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 apply them and build on that, given given how there was such an acute shock that has changed uh, the, the the limits, the possibilities of education in, in Myanmar for so many people now. I have been really impressed and amazed by what people have been able to put together in terms of educational resources since the coup. So I've been involved with two online universities, Spring University, Myanmar, and Virtual Federal University. And I know that NUG is also putting together educational resources. And I think that young people who experience a different kind of educational opportunity post-2010 aren't just going to go back into the old school system and you know, memorize the textbooks again. I just don't see that happening. Like they might do it in order to pass an exam they need to pass. But um, I think people's critical thinking skills, which they have always had, you know, it would always really annoy me when people would say like, oh yeah, like people just can't think critically. Of course they think critically. They think critically in their daily lives. It just, they've been trained out of doing that in school because you get punished if you do that in school. Um, So, when those restrictions were partially taken away, I think people got in the habit of like, oh, this is what education can be, really questioning and really learning from each other. And I think that that tradition can continue in the post-coup area. So not <laughs> not necessarily th- through government schools, right? But there are these parallel education systems that have been running for decades on the border um, in other areas and I think those will continue and expand and hopefully one day be able to feed into a new national education system in Myanmar after there's a democratic government again yeah that's that's heart, really heartening to hear um, technologically uh, you know it seems now um, such a huge number of people in Myanmar are kind of relying on digital technology to access, the kinds of education that we've been talking about, you know, it's very hard to do a, it's difficult to do a role play in the same way online as it is uh, in person. At the same time, there's a plethora now of digital online learning platforms and the whole world has gone through this convulsion of COVID-19. So what do you think about the possibilities of, uh, and the ways that digital technology is being used for education in Myanmar? Um, and then, I mean, not, not everybody who's, who has um, suffered majorly from the coup, for example, people in Sagan region, there are still there are schools there that are non-military uh, regime schools. And so there is learning in person going on um, using alternative methods. But I guess I just wonder, as someone who's in the sector, uh, what you think about um, this, this massive shift towards digital technology in the last few years, conveniently in a way, just before the coup. People are more digitally people are more digitally literate than um, ever before. Yeah, 
That's not so much my area of expertise, but I know that amazing things are happening, even in places where it's not possible to get internet, that I believe SUM is sending these devices called Raspberry Pi devices. It has all the course material on it. So it's almost like a mini um, computer or something. And you just download all the resources you need from that, but it's not connected to the internet. So you could take it to some region where there's not internet um, and use it there. And I think that those forward-thinking uses of digital technology are great, as well as going backward and rediscovering older technologies like radio. You know, people have been doing amazing things with radio and um, there's these people's radio station where they broadcast, I know they broadcast like VFU lectures and other educational materials. And so I think people are being so creative in the way that they use technologies, but not only digital technologies, right? Like also just all kinds of um, ways of communication that they are perhaps rediscovering because other avenues have been cut off. Something that also strikes me is that there's been an ongoing sort of uh, literature on the tension between, you know, different interpretations of history um, regarding ethnic difference, for example, with Korean people and the Korean parallel education system for a long time. Um, now we have this this alternative um, national, you know, quote unquote, sort of education system that, that you've um, referred to. I wonder now about the sort of tension between holistic open education and sort of activism, the same way that it's playing out in, in journalism, for example. It's, it's hard to um, be neutral in your reporting when, you know, one huge force that you're reporting on is trying to kill you. The same sort of goes in education. So, I wonder if you had any um, experiences, uh, advice, or um, yeah, op opinions regarding the way that the parallel education system is, is sort of going uh, post coup. I think it's not my place to to tell people how to navigate those difficult issues, right? But I can talk about what it was like, what it's like to teach in the U.S. in a very polarized. Um, political climate, right? So especially teaching social studies and history. And I really believe the U.S. historian Howard Zinn, who said, you know, there is no neutral historian and no neutral pedagogy for that matter. Like as a teacher, you bring to it your own values, your own politics. Like we're not striving for objectivity. That's not the goal. But the goal has to remain to allow students to discover their own truths. There's a difference between education and indoctrination. And if all the students in my class end up thinking exactly the way I do about politics and history, that I've probably not done a great job as a teacher. So I think we can accept that teaching is always a political act that's not neutral and that's not free of values, while also, one, welcoming the students in our classroom as they are, letting them start from where they are, um, and then building on that knowledge instead of excluding people based on experiences or perspectives that they've had. Um, so I think there's that balance between meeting our students where we are and creating a welcoming environment and then staying true to our values and acknowledging that our goals determine the kind of education that we're going to provide. So VFU, for instance, they want to provide an education that aims toward federalism, right? Federal is in their name. That's part of their values. And so in selecting course material, <laughs> that's a concern, right? If there were a course that didn't acknowledge biases of the lecturer or that didn't delve into various multiple perspectives, then that might not be something they would share. So I think you can have certain political values while also leaving the door open for people to come to various conclusions. Okay, very good. Yes, well put. 
Um, the last question that we always ask on Myanmar Musings is a recommendation question. Would you like to recommend anything to our listeners? It can be something related to what you've been talking about or not, as long as it you know has some relation to Myanmar in general. So what would you like to leave the listeners with today? I would say um, a Vipassana meditation retreat is something that I recommend. So I started doing these probably like 15 years ago, and it really changed my life for the better. So there are many religious traditions in Myanmar, Buddhism being only one of them, but it's the one that I have delved into the most. And yeah, if you've never done like a 10-day silent retreat, um, you can do it pretty much anywhere in the world these days, but a lot of the wisdom and insight goes back to that Southeast Asian region, um, and I would really recommend it. That's a great recommendation and one that I have never done and I would find extremely challenging. That's probably one of the most daunting things I can think of. <laughs> um, there may come a time. Okay, well, um, thank you very much, uh, Rose, for being here. I really appreciate it. And I want to, again, um, recommend that our listeners go and have a look at the recent edited volume um, and your contributions in there, Teaching for Peace and Social Justice in Myanmar. And then, of course, there's the Histories of Burma textbook, which I believe is uh, open access and free online for everybody to go and have a look at the student's book, teacher's book, and the, the source book. Yes. And if you want a kind of shorter, more concise and accessible version of the chapter, there's also a piece that I wrote in T-Circle that summarizes not only some of the stuff in the chapter, but also how I've been working with teachers um, on the border to kind of go beyond what, what textbooks can offer. That's great. Fantastic as well. Then the T-Circle piece, and I'll put the link in the notes to this podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you.